All right, we're going to get started with our third talk for the afternoon session. Um, John Rees from Facebook is going to talk to us about um, restructuring our code using the standard library. Hi, so I'm a production engineer at Facebook, and I work on our internal Python Foundation team. Uh, for context, Python is the third biggest language at Facebook and the number one language at Instagram. And the Python Foundation team helps to build tools and integrations that make Python better both inside and outside of the company. So today, I'm talking about refactoring code using the standard library. So the definition I'm using is uh, just general improvements or modifications to uh, source code, either simple or complicated, and either uh, hand-edited or uh, automated. Uh, but essentially is some sort of modification to the entire repository rather than just uh, one individual file. Uh, so some of the cases where you might want to do this would be uh, enforcing some sort of consistent style or formatting across your code base, uh, whether you're fighting the uh, tabs or spaces war uh, or, or instituting something like the black formatter. Uh, it could also be cases like removing some sort of like code smells like uh, named lambdas and replacing them with some sort of actual functions. Uh, cord could just be uh, removal of dead code and making sure that all the references to it are uh, removed from the rest of the code base. Uh, the example that I'm probably going to come back to multiple times is uh, essentially we'll have like some sort of uh, string literal uh, where you might want to actually have it translated when you're outputting it to the user rather than just uh, giving it directly. And maybe you have some comments saying that you should actually take care of that someday. Uh, but ideally we want to, you know, uh, wrap that sort of string literal in a function call, and then uh, for bonus points, remove the comment in front of it. Uh, sort of things, this is the kind of thing that we tend to do at Facebook, we call code mods, where it's an, an automated refactoring. And uh, we have a, essentially a monolithic repository for most uh, of our stuff at Facebook, and this essentially means all of our projects are in uh, one repo. This also means that if you were to change an API, and somebody's depending on that, you would immediately break their builds or their tests or something. And so you have to make sure that you're updating all of these references. And doing this in an automated way allows you to uh, most, e most easily do, uh, make these changes without uh, breaking any tests or, or builds. Um, so more specifically today, I'd like to talk about uh, syntax tree refactoring uh, as, com as compared to something like uh, using regular expressions or, or simple find replace. Uh, essentially, it's modifying the code as uh, these tree structures of nested objects. And it's generally based uh, somewhat on the actual Python grammar itself. And this gives you semantic context for each of the objects that you're editing. And if you do it right, then you're essentially guaranteed that you're going to generate valid syntax out of the end, as opposed to regular expressions. Um, so for the grammar itself, most languages uh, have this grammar that defines what tokens and syntax will be allowed. Uh, the, the most common form is bacchus Nauer form. And essentially, it's a set of rules that expand to more rules or string literals or a combination of the form. And uh, let's just say we wanted to look at uh, numbers you would define some rule that has all of the string literal digits that you would accept. It might be different for binary or hexadecimal. Um, and then if you actually want to build a larger number out of that, you would recursively use either a single digit or a combination of a digit and the recursive number rule. If you wanted to add them together, you could have another rule that defines the number, the string literal plus sign and another number. And you don't generally have to worry about white space in these cases because the tokenizer will take care of that. In the case of Python, it actually uses a modified form of this. Uh, the tokenizer deals with more than just white space. It also gives you some helpful uh, tokens for numbers, string literals, variable names, and more. Uh, the rules can also use more complicated uh, structures, like parentheses for optional uh, pieces, uh, I'm sorry, for alternative uh, structures, or you can use the uh, square brackets or star for, for optional elements. And if we wanted to look at how the actual uh, things like function calls would be defined in the grammar, this is an excerpt, excerpt from the actual grammar file, uh, kind of abridged so that it'll actually fit on the slide. Uh, the way that Python combines things together 
you would actually use this power rule at the bottom, uh, or at the top, expand it out towards the atom expression, which would allow you to optionally await whatever, uh, whatever you're working with. The atom would contain things like the actual variable or function name that you're editing or working with, or it could also be a number or a string. And then there's some number of optional trailers at the end, and these would represent things like either function calls, list access, or similar. And if you ex expand further through, uh, the trailer has the, the uh, string literals for the parentheses in the case of a function call, and then some optional argument list, which then uh, continues expanding through and through. And the arguments themselves, you know, common separated, and uh, would also include things like any type annotations or, or default values or the star arcs, things like that. So the way this would actually uh, look with the, the code example from before, uh, we're going to assume it's uh, Python 3 so that we actually get a print function instead of a statement. Um, I'm not sure if the rules are actually legible, but um, essentially you expand that starting with the power where it encompasses the entire uh, function call. And as you expand through the atom expression, again, also encompasses both because we're not doing any factorials. Uh, the atom expression would expand into the atom at the beginning for the, the variable uh, print, which is just part of the regular namespace, which again is itself a, a name token. Uh, the following part would be the uh, trailer, which contains the parentheses and the arguments. Uh, and then the arg list is just inside the parentheses, which then contains the one argument, which is the string literal. Uh, so when you actually get to the point of working with syntax trees, uh, these are generally based off of those grammar elements. The most common form is the abstract syntax tree. Uh, and again, in this tree structure, uh, leaves would be the, the edge tokens, and then nodes would be elements of the tree that either contain leaves or more nodes. But in the case of abstract syntax trees, this is generally a runtime focused uh, view of the code. So you lose a lot of uh, metadata like comments or formatting. And so if you were to actually try to um, put this back out into a source file, you'd end up losing a lot of that data. But the way this would actually look with the standard AST module um, is you'd have the call object at the bottom, uh, the name element for the function that you're actually going to be calling, and then the arguments uh, for the, the string. And if you look at this as actual objects that you would get back from the AST module, then you have the call object and the, the name and string and so forth. Uh, but again, if you were to actually dump this out, you would end up basically erasing all of your formatting and comments and so forth. So this is where uh, the concept of con concrete syntax trees come in. Uh, it follows the same sort of like uh, you know, tree structure with nodes and leaves. Um, but this actually contains everything we need in order to rebuild the original file. It preserves uh, white space, indentation, comments, a choice of single or double quotations, etc. And the standard library actually contains an implementation of this called lib2-3. It was originally built for the 2-3 to conversion code for moving code from Python 2 to Python 3. But the benefit of this is that it, it can parse all Python grammars from Python 2 or Python 3. Um, so the reason uh, to, to use this rather than some of the alternatives out there might be that it's because it's part of the standard library, it's going to be well maintained and supported as, as new versions come out. Uh, when uh, new elements of the grammar get added to the language, uh, lib2 to 3 is immediately updated to support this. And that means you can, if you're using lib2 to 3, you can be ready for new versions immediately rather than waiting for a library to actually uh, make their own updates. And hopefully for us, this actually contains a refactoring framework that uh, makes it even more useful. So the tree structure that lib2 to 3 uses, again, there's a leaf for each distinct token in the uh, source file. And the node is basically semantic groupings of those tokens based off the grammar rules. Um, uh, rather than having uh, special objects like the AST module does though, it has just a node and leaf class and uses integer identifiers to decide or to determine what type each uh, element in the tree is. But the other benefit is that it actually provides a collapsed grammar, grammar tree. So if we take the example from earlier where you expand out all these individual elements, uh, you can see there's a lot of redundancies in it. Uh, it's like name and atom actually represent the same element in code as does the string argument and arg list or atom expression and power. 
And in lib two to three, it actually pulls out those redundancies. So you have a tree where the, the base of the tree is the power node. And that's, that node's children is the name token for print and the trailer node for the actual arguments. And then inside the trailer is just the string literal rather than uh, multiple layers. So again, uh, the way this would look in code is the, uh, we have the leaf and the node class. They both uh, extend the, the base class. And they both use an integer type to determine what they are. In the case of the leaf, that's an integer representing the token type. And the, in the case of the node, that's an integer representing the uh, grammar rule that it's part of. Uh, for leaves, the value is the actual on-disk representation of that element. And in the case of node, you have children, which is a list of any, uh, any leaf or node objects contained within it. And they both share this prefix string, which is uh, all of the white space co uh, formatting, excuse me, new lines, and, and so forth uh, that, that precedes that element in the tree. And this is what allows us to actually dump it back out and get the same original uh, content. Um, so if we look at how this maps to our example and focus on the uh, string token here, the, uh, the actual object we would get from lib2 to 3 is uh, of the leaf class. The, the integer ID for it is, is that of a string literal. And the value, again, is exactly what's on disk. If we had chosen uh, single quotes for it instead of double quotes, it would have been represented in that string. Similarly, if we had chosen to use uh, triple quotes for uh, doc strings or something. Um, and in this case, the prefix is empty because there's nothing between the opening parenthesis and the string literal. Um, if we back out to the trailer element, um, this actually contains the parentheses and the, uh, the argument. And, but because this is part of the actual uh, grammar rule, this is now a node type. And uh, the integer is, is defining that it's a trailer. And the children is just a list of those three leaf elements, the opening parenthesis, the string literal, and the closing parenthesis. Again, the prefix here is empty, but if we were looking instead at the, uh, the power node below it, we would see the, uh, the to-do comment and uh, the new line as part of that prefix. So ultimately, we really just want to build code mods with this. Uh, and lib2 to 3 provides a concept of uh, fixers, which these would represent uh, in individual pieces of the 2 to 3 uh, conversion tool, things like uh, moving from the print statement to the print function or changing the way integer, integer division works, things like that. Uh, so instead, we actually want to uh, build our own fixers to do this. And this ultimately gives us a way to um, in, inspect the, the syntax tree and make changes to it. So fixers use the concept of a, a pattern matching, which is a string to represent the grammar we're looking for. And then it has a transform method to actually provide uh, or actually perform the transform once the match is made. So an individual fixer would look like this in code. Uh, you have the, the pattern string, which I'll get to in a moment, and then the transform method that I'll get to a little bit later. So the way the pattern matching works is, again, it's a string, but it's based off of the actual grammar elements we want to look for. You can provide arbitrary nesting or alternatives if you wanted to uh, look for any cases of multiple different types of elements. And then you can capture uh, subtree sub elements within that uh, pattern. And your pattern could also include things like string literals or, or individual tokens that you want to match rather than just the grammar rules. The way this would look if we wanted to actually find all cases in our code where the print function is called, regardless of what the arguments were, uh, the pattern string could be something similar to this. It says we want to look for at the, at the base of it is the power node. Uh, we're using the string literal print to say we only care about print functions. It could also just be name if you wanted to capture any function call. Um, and then we're using the trailer node to, to basically define that it's actually a function call rather than a list access or something. We have to put in the, the literal parentheses. And in this case, we use any to represent we don't really care what the type is of the element in, inside, and the star to say that it could be zero or more. And in this case, we're also capturing this using args equal uh, to say that, that that's an element that we actually care about modifying later. 
uh, once the uh, once lib2 to, lib to three finds a, a match in the tree, it can call the, the transform on our, on our class. And that transform can do any sort of modification at once, uh, anything from like adding new elements to the tree, removing them, replacing them, or doing in-place modifications. And it's not restricted to just the matched elements. We can go anywhere up or down the tree to actually change things we want. The, the pattern match simply provides essentially the starting point for, for each transformation. So if we go back to the code mod we originally wanted, where we take, take this bit of code and, and wrap the string literal in the translate call, um, we can build the fixer like this. We, we create the, the class, we provide the, the pattern match, in this case, it's very similar to before, but now we are uh, specifically looking for function calls where uh, it takes just a single string literal. And in this case, we're capturing it to the keyword S. And then we have a transform method that would actually do the work. Uh, using type annotations, uh, basically this method would take uh, the first node or, or leaf that was matched by the pattern uh, and this could be, again, either a leaf or node, which is represented by base. And the results is all of the captured elements uh, from our pattern. This would be like string mapping uh, from, let's say, the, the S keyword to the actual string literal token. Uh, so our actual transform method to provide the transform we want, uh, we, we first grab the string literal out of that results dictionary. And then we tell lib2 to 3 that we want to replace it in the syntax tree with a, a new element. And we'll use some of the lib2 to 3 helpers to, to generate the actual leaf and node objects for a function call. And in this case, we use uh, a clone of the string literal token because we're simultaneously replacing it and putting it back into the tree. And then for the bonus points of, of removing the uh, preceding uh, comment, we simply take the prefix string off of the matched node, which in this case would be the power element, and we simply do a regex substitution on it to find any, any line in that prefix that's the to-do comment and simply replace it with an empty string. And by putting that back onto the prefix, then it'll automatically update the code appropriately. So now that we have our fixer class, uh, we actually need to use uh, lib2to3's refactoring tools to actually execute this. And this will essentially take some number of fixers and run it on each of the files that we care about. And it'll run the, essentially, it'll walk through the syntax tree looking for matching nodes and run the transform methods whenever there's a, an appropriate match. And then once all of the uh, matches and transforms have been executed, it will collect the final version of the syntax tree and dump that back out to disk or generate a diff or something of that sort. Um, the caveat here is that it defaults to importing the two to three fixers. And so we just need to do a simple uh, subclass to actually change that behavior. So we just override this so that rather than importing, it's just instantiating the fixer classes. And then we can actually run this by uh, giving it the, the fixer class that we had and run it on our source file or directory and then tell it to give us the results. Uh, in this case, it just could be a, a simple uh, one-line diff where it's, it reads out the, uh, the to-do and, and changes the, uh, wraps it in the TR function. Um, if you want any of the example code, it's on my GitHub uh, jre slash pycon. Uh, but this actually provides, I'm sorry, doing this with lib2 to 3, there actually ends up being a lot of boilerplate. Um, and so there's a lot of cases where you probably don't want to reinvent this every time you want to do these sorts of refactoring. Uh, so I'm actually kind of excited, excited to announce that uh, Facebook has open sourced a tool to do this uh, called Bowler. It is, provides safe refactoring for modern Python. Um, this builds on all the concepts that I covered earlier in the talk. Uh, it provides a fluent API that allows you to chain method calls off of a single starting class. And uh, it's optimized for large code bases and will uh, make sure to use full advantage of all the cores on your machine. And it's, again, open sourced, freely available, and MIT licensed. So uh, the reason to use this over some of the other tools uh, is, again, because it's built on lib2 to 3. There will be automatic support for new Python releases as they come out. And it was designed to uh, allow for composable uh, uh, pieces of refactoring that you can reuse in the future. And this allowed us to 
uh, really productionize some of our refactoring tools and get more long-term lasting value out of them. So rather than needing to rebuild this every time you have a similar use case, you can either uh, just reuse one exactly or, or take the pieces from what you have and, and put them back together into uh, different uh, arrangements. And really it was designed to be useful as both a tool and a library. So you can either use it as, as like a CLI command or you can integrate it with other pieces of software to, to automate a lot of this. Uh, the way it works, again with the, the Fluent API, you build a query pipeline essentially where you, you build multiple transforms. and Each one consists of a selector which generates the, the pattern matching, uh, some optional fil filter functions to actually reduce the set of matches, and then uh, modifier functions to actually do the transforms on the syntax tree whenever there's a filtered match. And uh, Bowler will actually either generate diffs or provide interactive results. So if you've used something like git add p uh, or whatever the mercurial equivalent is, uh, it, it will show you a diff for each hunk and you can say yes or no and make sure that every piece of it that you're working on is, is actually a modification you want to make. Uh, the way this would look with the, the Fluent API is something similar to this. Again, it's, it's method chaining off of a single object. Um, you would start the pipeline by creating the query object, tell it the source file or directory uh, that you want to operate on. Uh, you use the selector to actually define what you're matching against. In this case, we'll uh, match against any use of the print function. Uh, and by default, the selector will actually find if, if there was a case where we defined a print function or imported a print function, it would find that as well. And then we can filter those results to say we only care about cases where the function's actually being called rather than defined. And we can add a custom filter to further restrict that to when it has just the one string literal as its argument. And then we can mostly reuse the function we had earlier to actually do the modification and wrap it in the translation uh, call. And then ultimately, we tell it we want to generate a diff. There's al alternatives for actually generating the interactive output. Um, the custom filter function that I mentioned uh, essentially returns true or false, whether or not the, the element should be modified. It takes the leafer node and the, the capture dictionary. You basically treat it the same way you would with transforms. You get the, the captured element out of it, and in this case, we look to see if the first argument from that uh, function is uh, the string literal and return true or false. The actual modification looks almost exactly like what we had before. Again, a leaf of the node takes the leaf or node and the capture dictionary, and then uh, does the appropriate uh, change in the syntax tree. And then when we actually uh, want to run this, we just basically put it in a file, uh, say bowler run and the, the code mod file, and it will actually generate the output uh, right there as the diff. Again, al alternatives for like interactive modes and, and things like that. Um, so that's basically bowler in a nutshell. Um, it's uh, early access, part of the Facebook incubator on GitHub. Uh, it was actually my first project as I joined the Python Foundation team at Facebook. And it was used to solve some of our uh, real internal use cases. Um, but because of some of these caveats, like the, the API is still being uh, fleshed out, um, there's an incomplete set of selectors or filters or transforms, and as always, can use more testing. Um, but we definitely want to continue supporting and improving it. We want to reduce some of the boilerplate around creating uh, new code mods and add some more helper functions. And uh, ultimately, we want to move it to the point where it actually gains some more linter style features. Uh, and similarly, integration with uh, tools like Fabricator or GitHub. Uh, the benefit in case of linter features would be that uh, you're, all, you're able to check against the actual syntax tree instead of just regular expressions and simultaneously provide automatic uh, fixes if, if that's something that would be possible. Um, but more than anything else, uh, we want a diverse base of contributors and we want to be able to make sure that we're supporting uh, multiple use cases both inside and outside of Facebook and we want to make this one of the best tools available. So, uh, I urge you to check it out uh, today. It's at pybowler.io. 
Uh, there's plenty of documentation there on some of these concepts, the, how to get started using it, uh, or how to contribute to the project if you're interested, as well as a link to, uh, link to our GitHub for it. So, um, looks like I have about five minutes for questions. Um, if, if I don't, if there's too many questions or whatever, feel free to uh, reach out to me in the halls for more questions or discussions later. But thank you. So, do we have any questions? Um, I'm, thank you. Uh, regarding what you can do with it, what are some other examples than just a sure. single function, like wrapping a function? Uh, so, some of the common use cases that uh, we built it for would be things like, let's say you wanted to rename an object somewhere and uh, you wanted to then update all of the references throughout the code base. Um, or if you wanted to change some of the arguments that a function or method took, you could either add new arguments to it and update all of the callers or remove an argument and automatically update all the callers, that sort of thing. And I, ideally, like any, any sort of thing you would want to do with uh, like this sort of automated refactoring should be possible. It's just a matter of did we implement it in the, in the baseline set of features or, or will it need more work? More questions? Uh, thanks, yeah, really interesting. Um, so I'm fairly comfortable with regex mm -hmm. refactoring on a large scale like that. I can see how this could make for far safer um, refactors. As you've gotten used to it, do you find it's faster or slower to use than like to set up a big one than a regex system? Um, I mean, I think it's always going to be a little bit slower because you first have to uh, decompile it into the syntax tree and then walk that tree comparing it to all of these uh, patterns. But I mean, we have a fairly large Python code base at Facebook and I was able to do like some of the example refactoring that I mentioned before um, on our entire code base in less than a minute, so. Oh yeah, yeah. I was rather than the runtime, yeah, more the time it takes to put together the and, and yes, exactly. It's like in, in the case of actually building some of the code mods, it might take a little bit more than, than a, a regular expression, but the yeah. benefit is that... The safety. It, especially if you're using uh, some of the larger formats with type annotation and so forth, it means that much less complicated that your regular expression would need to be compared to what this can do fairly trivially. Mm -hmm. um, so like, Im imagine a world where you have so many arguments that you're breaking them onto multiple lines and you want to modify one of those arguments but you want to make sure that it's for a specific function. Yep. Now your yep. regular expression has to be a multi-line regular expression. Yeah, whereas definitely. this can do that regardless of whether it's one line or multiple. Yeah, thanks. Any more questions? Hi, um, do you think this would be a suitable, or LibTPy, uh, would be a suitable tool for style checking students' code? Um, I mean, I think it should be, like if you're, depends on how aggressive you wanna be on, on various things. It might be, like if, you, if you're just specifically checking for style, it might actually be better to just pick a formatting uh, system that's already out there like black or something of that sort and simply say if it matches this then that's fine or I know there's also plenty of like pep8 linters that will complain if you if you just want to be a little bit more lax about what the style is um, I'm sure it'd be possible to build it in this case it's just maybe not uh, what it's designed for like the more like the linting things I was talking about earlier is more like uh, we've seen cases where people want to have like a lint rule if you're using, let's say, a deprecated function or a deprecated module or method or something like that. It'd be useful to be able to say in this case that it's coming from that specific module or, or it's a function call of that name. Like, let's, let's say that's deprecated. Thank you. All right, we have time for one more quick question if anyone has one.
All right. Um, please thank John for his talk. Sure.